All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come to you and we thank you and praise you for giving us this night. Lord, um, you are wonderful and awesome in this place. And I ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to just anoint me one more time. Please let the mantle of teacher come and rest on me and enable me to be accurate and clear and plain with what it is that you've put on my heart for tonight. And uh, Lord, we just love you and um, do a work in us, God, that can only be done by your spirit. And we'll thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this series is Because He Lives, and tonight is actually lesson number three. And um, uh, the, the first lesson I talked about how this was really birthed in my heart, uh, this, the words of Because He Lives and that particular song comes from the Gaithers, Bill and Gloria Gaither. And the words to the song are so powerful Honestly, they are so theologically strong, and uh, I always want you to have them. So I would ask you as you're coming to class for this series, if you would just remember to bring them back with you, that would be great. And uh, the first stanza, God sent his son, they called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. Can you say amen? He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Wonderful chorus. Because he lives, what? I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. He hasn't given us the spirit of fear. Amen. But power and love and a sound mind. Because I know he holds the future. Jeremiah 29, 11, the plans that he has for you, the divine destiny, the divine future he has, and all of eternity, amen, because I know he holds the future and life is worth living just because he lives. Talks about how sweet to hold a newborn baby, which is how the song was really birthed from their hearts, and feel the pride and joy that God gives, he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance, this child can face uncertain days. Why? Because he lives. And then one day I'll cross the river. I'll fight life's final war with pain, no more, no more pain, no more fighting the wars here, amen. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns, amen. And I gave you John 14, nine at the bottom. Jesus said, because I live, you also will live. Can you say amen? Amen, amen. So then last time that we were together, uh, we turned our hearts toward um, three, we're a particular woman, a woman. But I told you as I began that teaching that we're actually going to look at three different women who really, you, you heard Jean pray tonight from Psalm 51, a broken and a contrite heart God will never deny. He will never deny. Now that seems kind of counterintuitive, $50 word, okay? But if, if God is making us whole, then why is it important to be broken? Because when we're broken before him, who we were is just poured out. It's just poured out to him. And he begins the work to make us really whole. And it's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful thing as God does this work. And I, I believe with all my heart, some people teach it like there's one occurrence of this in the Bible. But I, I believe with all my heart because I believe that every detail that's in the Bible, every specific detail that's in the Bible is there for a reason. And so when we go to the word, we can see that there are three different times when a woman came to Jesus while Jesus was still alive here on this earth and really poured out her heart to him. The symbol of her pouring out her heart 
was that she poured out the contents of an alabaster box. And I believe that in the sharing of the situations of these three separate women, whether you are a woman or a man, that in this, somewhere in these stories, we will see our story. Everyone has a story, amen? Everyone has a story. And so I shared with you last time, lesson two, which was entitled, In Her Memory. And it came from Mark 14, verses one through nine. And as I read through it quickly, I will emphasize particular words that I want you to repeat after me. All right. Mark 14, chapter one. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were two days away. Say that with me. Two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, say Bethany, Bethany, which is just over the hill, really, from the Garden of Gethsemane. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, Simon the leper, it was interesting because pastor read this passage of scripture in service this past weekend. Simon the leper, obviously a man whom Jesus had healed. Amen? So they're in Bethany, It's two days before Passover. They're in the home of Simon the leper, and a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Say that with me, on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. And Jesus, speaking for her, in her defense, just as he does for us, can you say amen? amen. Just as he does for us, says, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body. Listen to this. Beforehand, to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, What she has done will also be told in memory of her, in her memory, not in memory of him. This is an amazing passage of scripture, not in memory of him, in memory of her. Her name is not even mentioned here. It's she's a woman, right? A woman who comes with with nard, spike nard, and pastor didn't talk about it, but I I gave you a value. That spike nard, that amount of spike nard in today's money, that pure nard would be approximately $54,500. I mean, this was valuable, valuable. And what the the, uh, amount would be about a pint. It said it would be worth a year's wages at that time. The Amplified says it was costly. It was costly. And you know what? It it was costly to her, not because of the financial value, but because of what it was that she wanted to express to Jesus. It was costly. There's a famous song, um, Alabaster Box. You don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box, right? We, we don't know the cost of the oil in her box, but you know what? She broke it. She broke it. 
The Amplified says that what she did was good and beautiful and praiseworthy and noble, and she broke it and poured it out and anointed his head, and the fragrance filled the room. Now, last time we were together, some of you weren't here. You can pick these up. There are plastic bags here, and if you will open that plastic bag, in there you will find a fragrance stick. Can you smell it? Can you smell it? Okay, that is one drop of spike nard. One drop of nard. One drop is this strong. And if you will keep this in this bag, this will retain this fragrance forever. It is pure spike nard. It is pure spike nard. It was found at Jesus' time only in the Himalayas, so it had to be literally shipped in. It was exceedingly valuable. And it was, it, it, and so she had this in this box. So you can imagine, you have this fragrance, imagine a pint of it. A pint of it being broken, you better believe the fragrance filled the room. Amen? Everyone in that room knew something significant had happened. Something had happened. You know what? Did she know she was anointing him for burial? I am sure she did not. What did she know? She knew she wanted to express her love to Jesus in some tangible way and she poured out what she had. Amen? Amen. Amen. It was hers. It was a part of her. We have no idea how she got it. No idea. Nor, obviously, do we need to know. And you know what? It's the same with us. When we come to a place where we're ready to be broken before Jesus, nobody else knows the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. No one knows what it is that I have been carrying, right? That I've been carrying, the cost of it, but Jesus knows, amen? And because of his life, because he was alive, her life was changed, amen? And it's just the same with us. Now would you turn with me please to the second woman? And we read about her in Luke chapter seven, Luke chapter seven starting at verse 36. All right, now you will see, as soon as I begin to read, that they, there are differences from what we read before. Luke 7, verse 36. When one of the Pharisees, Pharisees, Jewish religious leader, invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisees' house and reclined at the table. Now people get confused because later we're going to find out this Pharisee's name is also Simon. So people get confused. It's Simon. Simon was a very common name. It was a very common name. Verse 37, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there <laughs> with an alabaster jar of perfume. Well, why would this be, Pastor Connie? Because this was not uncommon, that women would find a way to collect something valuable. As she stood behind him, at his feet, where was it before? At his head, right? At his head. She is behind him at his fed feet weeping. And she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now, we're going to see in just a little bit that we are told in the word, and if you read it in context, this is not in Bethany. This is in the Galilee. And this was earlier, earlier in Jesus' ministry. This was in the Galilee. 
earlier in Jesus' ministry than the one we read before. It's at the home of a Simon, yes, but it's Simon the Pharisee, a Jewish religious leader, and it's in Capernaum in the Galilee. So it's not Bethany, it's not the same time, it, it's not the same person's home, and it's not the same town. But here it is. We have a woman, a woman, and some translations read it this way, who had lived a sinful life. That's my favorite translation. Because by the time this woman comes to Jesus, something has happened in her. It's something has happened. The Amplified says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house in the region of the Galilee and reclined at the table. Now there was a woman in the city who was known as a sinner. As I look around this room, how might people have known you the way you used to live, right? How might people have known you the way you used to live? Would you have been known as a sinner? I would have been with the way I was living my life, even though I was professing to be a Christian. Now, she was known as a sinner when she found out that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began wetting his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and respectfully kissed his feet as an act signifying both affection and submission and anointed them with perfume. She stood behind him. You know, the caption in my Bible says, Jesus anointed by a sinful woman. And next to it, I have written, not. She had been a sinful woman. She was no longer a sinful woman. You will see this. She comes broken before Jesus. Broken. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping. He's reclined. So he's reclined. That's how they ate. They were reclined and leaning against pillows at low tables, not like we sit here. So in order for her to get to his feet, she is bowing low. She is on her knees, and she is bowing low, and her tears are wetting his feet. <laughs> Before that woman had anointed his head, this one is anointing his feet. Her hair, a woman's hair in that day, was her crowning adornment, and for her to take it and let the, the, the tears fall on what you will see were his dirty feet, really his dirty feet, she didn't care. Her tears were washing his feet, and she was then drying them with her hair and pours perfume on them. Now, I want you to know that at that time, the significance of anointing feet, if you anointed feet, it was a mark of affection and reverence a mark of affection and reverence. It was practiced by a supplicant when a request needed to be made. In other words, a humble act in order to make a request. And it was also done by people who had been conquered as a token of subjection and obedience. This woman had been conquered by Jesus. She'd been conquered. Have you allowed Jesus to conquer you? Have you allowed him to be Lord over you? She was conquered. She anointed him for one reason, and that was to bring him pleasure. That was to bring him comfort. 
Let me ask you, have you ever had a foot massage? Have you ever had oil massaged into your feet? It is so soothing and, and so amazing. Sheer comfort. That's what she longed to bring him. So continuing on in that passage of scripture, Luke 7, verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he'd know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is. He's a seeker, right? This Pharisee, this Jew, he's, he's a seeker. What's going on with this Jesus, right? How many of you have seen The Chosen? Yeah, what's going on with this Jesus, right? If this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, excuse me? Who had he been talking to? Himself, right? He wasn't speaking this out loud. He wasn't. He, he didn't say it to Jesus. He was saying it to himself. Jesus knows what we're saying to ourselves. He knows what we're thinking. We see that in the scripture as well. So Jesus answered him. And Jesus answered him in the way that Jesus answers so often by asking questions. Okay? Uh, I love it. It's, it's all the way from the beginning when God goes looking for Adam and Eve when they have sinned and he asks them, where are you? Like he doesn't know, right? It's a spiritual question. Jesus answered him. <laughs> Had he asked Jesus a question? No, he, he's talking to himself. Jesus answered him, Simon, as I said, very common name. I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, here's the question. Which of them will love him more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Hmm. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, which was the custom. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Wow. As her great love has shown. Why was she expressing this love? Because she knew her sin. Look at how this is written. Her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. She knew he had forgiven her. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What an amazing passage of scripture. Now let me ask you, which do you think touched Jesus' heart more? The oil or her tears? Which? Her tears. 
her tears. And let me tell you, he sees every tear. He sees every tear. Even when it, we're in that terrible place where, where we're not even reaching out to him and we're t- crying all those wasted tears, and men cry too, all those wasted tears, he sees those tears. But oh, the tears that touch his heart are the tears that we cry, the tears of repentance, the tears of thanksgiving, when we know we have been forgiven. Can you say amen? Her tears, Jesus' words, tell us everything she did to worship him touched him deeply. Everything. And verse 47, he says to Simon, and you know others were listening, hearing, this fragrance had filled the room again, right? It had filled this room. You know all the attention was on this particular occurrence. And Jesus says, her, he's speaking about her, her many sins are forgiven. Why? For she loved much. She loved Jesus. And then he speaks to her personally, personally. And he says to her, your sins are forgiven. You know, it's like he's saying, don't listen to what they're saying. Don't listen to their opinion of what your reputation has been. Don't listen to what other people are saying about you. Jesus is saying, this is between you and me. This is between you and me. Can you say amen? Amen. He says, your sins are forgiven. That's what he says to her. It doesn't matter what they think they, doesn't matter what they say, doesn't matter what they do. He's saying, your sins are forgiven. Can you say amen? You listen to me. Every one of you listen to me. As you begin to come to this place, to this broken and spilled out place, if it's new to you, other people in your life who have known you as you used to be, they're not going to buy it, buddy. They're just going to be standing by waiting for you to blow it, right? They're just standing in the wings waiting for you to mess it up waiting for you to absolutely blow it, and they're completely certain that you will. Why? Because they don't know your Jesus. They don't know your Jesus. Amen? Amen. Doesn't matter what they think. Doesn't matter what they say. And don't let it matter what they do. Because people know our hot buttons. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. They know how to get our goat, right? They know how to press the buttons, right? To press the buttons. Don't let them. Don't let them. Just listen to what Jesus has to say. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And then in verse 50, it is so awesome because he says to her, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to own this. I want you to own it. He says in verse 50, your faith has saved you. Her faith. He's saying, you, you, yes, I'm here. I'm doing a work. I'm going to continue doing a work, but it's your faith that's key here. Amen? It's your faith. It's my faith. It's my faith that makes that life active that makes that salvation active in me. Amen? He's alive whether I receive his life or not. The question is, is he alive in me? Amen? If you're with me, wave something. Say amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen? And he says to her, listen to this. Your faith has saved you. Saved. What's that word saved mean when it's translated? 
to be made new, to be made sound, to be made holy, to be put together. And then he says to her, now go. Go in peace. Go in peace. New life. Go in peace. This woman had simple, childlike faith that he could and he would and he did forgive her. You know, she was saying, you know, I don't know much, but this is what I know of Jesus. This is what his life has done for me. This is what I know of Jesus. And the fragrance of that filled that room. Do you think the people in that room ever forgot that moment? Ever? You think the one last, last time we were together ever forgot that? The people in that room? Never. Never. And we're going to share another one next time. Different place, different time, different person. But the same thing happens again. The nard, broken, spilled out. You know, in all of our lives, aroma is a trigger. Right? Sometimes for good, sometimes not for good. Right? Okay? There are times when you're going to need to take that little plastic bag when you're feeling some temptation, when some remembrance of an aroma comes back to you. I mean, I, I want to tell you, I smoked cigarettes, and you're all going, what? Okay, I smoked cigarettes for less than a year, right? And I smoked maybe four or five cigarettes a day. Hardly considered a addicted smoker, right? But I want you to know, after I quit smoking, after I quit smoking, for decades after that, when I would be somewhere and someone would light up a cigarette, a thought would come to me and I would think, oh, that smells good. Maybe I'll have a cigarette. And I'd be, what? What? It can, can any of you relate to what I'm saying? And it may not be cigarettes, right? <laughs> you can relate to what I'm saying. But then there are other aromas that are so sweet and bring back such, what, yeah, I mean, I, I love candles. I love candles. And it's time, listen, I'm done with summer. It's over. Forget it. I am done. <laughs> right? I'm done with this summer, right? I mean, I broke out the pumpkin spice and the, right? I, I am done with it. Okay, but just the aromas of fall, and then we'll come to the aromas of, of Christmas time. You fully understand what I'm saying, okay? She said, this is what I know of Jesus, and this is what his life has done for me. I want you to know, he's alive. He's alive. Forgiving sin to this moment, just as he was at this time. What was the cost of the oil in her alabaster box? This was a sinful woman. She had been a sinful woman. What had she done to earn enough money or earn someone putting that much value into a container of nard. What had she done? We don't know. We don't know the cost of the oil in her box. What's the cost of the oil in your box? Listen, you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. When I came back to Jesus... My knowing the things that I had done and knowing he knew the things that I had done, you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. But I love him so much. 
because he has forgiven me of so much. He has forgiven me of so much and just allowed me to be broken and open before him and pour out the contents of my heart and give up those things that I had gathered unto myself from a life that I should have never lived. But he forgave me. He forgave me. The title of this lesson is Uncontainable Love. Uncontainable Love. She loved him so much because she had been forgiven so much. She acted it out in worship and supplication to him. Why? Because he was alive. And all I can say to you from my life is I love him so much because he's forgiven me of so much. And so I worship him. And so I praise him. Why? Because he lives. Amen? Amen. And because he lives still. And because I have made a choice. My faith extended to receive his love and his life in me. And because he lives, I live also. Can you say amen? Amen. With every head down. Every head down. As I said when we started, everyone has a story. Everyone has a story. I don't know the cost of the oil in your alabaster box. But I know the cost to save us. And it was Jesus' life on the cross, the perfect Lamb of God. How amazing that he was alive for these women to just pour out their hearts to him. But how amazing that he's still alive for us to pour out our hearts to him. Whether we're women or men or children, he's still alive. But we have to act. He's alive whether we receive him or not. He's alive whether we believe in him or not. But we're given that amazing privilege to accept him. The word's very clear. Paul wrote to us, how do we do this? We believe in our heart and confess with our mouths that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is Lord. And somehow, the most amazing miracle ever happens, and we're born again and translated from death to life. And as we ask his forgiveness, we are forgiven and forgiven and forgiven. So if you've never done this, tonight's your night. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, tonight's your night. Or maybe like me, you did this, and along the way, you lost your way. You lost your way. Well, tonight's your night to come back to the feet of Jesus in supplication, simply saying, Lord, I need you, and I want you, and I accept you. If either one of those is you, would you just raise your hand so that I can pray for you? If you need to accept Jesus as your Savior or wholeheartedly recommit your life to him. Looking across this room, I offer it to those of you who are watching by video. Let this night 
this day, this moment, be your moment. Would you all just repeat after me? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you now, and I fully know I need a Savior. Jesus, I need you. And I know you're the Son of God. You went to the cross for me. But you're alive. You're alive. Jesus, come into my heart. I give you my life. I declare that you are my Lord and my Savior. Heavenly Father, only you know what I have done. But you do know. Jesus, you know. And I thank you that you give me the privilege to be forgiven much because you love me so much. I ask you to forgive me. And as you do, I declare, I love you, Jesus. You're my Savior. You're my Lord for now and forevermore. And because you live, I live also. In Jesus' name. Amen? Can you give him praise? Can you give him praise? Give him praise. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every, every person in this room, every woman in this room, everyone who's watching by video. Lord, it's amazing to me that you know exactly the moment when we need to hear your word. And Lord, I just thank you for giving us this night. These women so deeply touch my heart because they are so broken and open before you. And it blesses you so much. We so often feel, Lord, like we got to keep it all closed in. We got to hide it all and never, ever let it pour out of us. And all that does is keep us in absolute bondage and in hurt and in pain. It blesses you when we just pour it out and thank you for who you are and for your forgiveness. Now, Lord, would you take each one in this place home to their places of rest tonight with huge angels on guard round about them, Lord. I just ask you, Lord, to bless them and keep them and may your face shine upon them. And we just give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. We've talked about two scenes now. Have either one of these spoken to your individual life? Let me see your hands. Your individual life? Yeah. Amen. So read these passages of scriptures. Identify with these women. That's why they're there. That's why they are there. First one in memory of her. Second one is just uncontainable love. She loved him so much she could not contain it. Amen? Let us live our lives like that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen and amen. Hallelujah.